All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of great Kung Fu habits, lots of, is the Bruce Lee Real Fight channel the new beardy? Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing rather well, Sifu. How are you? Doing well, doing well. You yeah. know, I think we're coming up... How was on, your week? A week was good. Yeah. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, we're coming up on uh, our second year of uh, KFG. You know, our 100th episode is coming up soon, too. It is coming up soon, yeah. right? But it's really the 104th episode that matters, because that's the end of exactly two years, because we do one episode oh, a week, true, true. right? So I don't know. Is the 100th episode doing, a big deal, or is the 104th? They're doing math, yeah, right? 104th. 104th. That's the real 104th one. 104th Street. All right? 104th and yeah. Park. The, the disembodied voice has spoken, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so lots of exciting things. So the podcast is also brought to us, this greater audience, to talk about these kind of ridiculous things. And uh, it's great. We want to thank the audience for being so cool and everyone supporting us on Patreon Asking and everything questions. like that. Yes. Great questions. Yeah, it's, it's fun because, you know, I get to, you know, this is basically like when we started this podcast, I said, you know, these are like the conversations you and I would just have when we're just hanging out. Yeah. And now the only and difference is... I just sit is, there in awe and fascinated right, by, and, at the shit you say. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry and, about and, and, and like, how do you know all this stuff? That's usually in like my Yeah, but if, you, but if you spend any amount of time with me, you realize yeah. how how much I know about whatever I know about is, is directly <laughs> proportionate to how little I know about anything else. else okay, right? gotcha. yeah. I want to thank the audience for actually saving us all money in therapy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is our group therapy, this is our group therapy right all here. All right, all right. Um, yeah, and it's, it's great. So basically, we just had this idea to just put a camera in front of us. And, uh, and yeah, so, uh, so anyway, a couple, couple little changes to uh, Wing Chun Illustrated, which is like mm -hmm. a you know, longtime sponsor of us. It's a big time us. magazine, yeah. Yeah, um, they, um, they've been so gracious in sponsoring us for such a long time. I mean, yeah. even uh, they were also our sponsor during the Dudes of Kung Fu era with me and Big Sean. Sweet. So they've been, you know, they've been around since day one. And uh, we, uh, you know, you definitely want people to read the magazine. So uh, Wing Chun Illustrated magazine comes out every other month. Uh, so it doesn't come out every month. It comes out every other okay. month. And it uh, can be watched. You can look at it digitally. on the, They have the app where you can kind of like look at it on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or if you want, you can order like a glossy print-on-demand version of it, which is really nice. I've ordered a bunch Ooh. of those, like especially like on the one where I'm on the cover. Yeah. I got a bunch yeah. of those. Which but, cover is this, by the way? My cover? Yeah. Oh, my cover's very early on. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, it's like in the, it's, I think I it's it was like, maybe 18 or something, uh, issue yeah. 18 or something like that. Um, so it's very, very, very early on. This is a number of years ago. Mm. And, um, you know, since then, I also became a columnist for Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. So I have the right. Kung Fu Genius column, uh, which Sweet comes out with every edition. Uh, um, I you know, it's very similar to what I do here. It's just me ranting about some shit for, for 900 words, right? <laughs> that, is that what it has to be, 900 words? Yeah, it's 900 words because it's a column. So, Nothing um, more. Uh, yeah, because I have to fit in the space uh -huh. like that he gives me. Um, it's a lot of fun because a lot of times I, sometimes I'll write the article in advance because mm. I'm just so busy. So I'll just write something. And then when he needs the article, I'm like, okay, I'll polish it up. I'll send it to you. And other times I get so busy. Uh, Eric is so great. He'll always send me this text like, um, hey, Alex, uh, yeah. ho uh, how's, how's that article coming along? I need it by Friday. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, don't worry. I'll get it by Friday. <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to write about? Mm. And then I just think for a moment, all right, what's annoying the hell out of me lately? <laughs> Oh, right. I saw this thing on Instagram. Okay. I'm going to write an article about that. And oh, then yes. I usually write those things in, um, in about an hour. So yeah. it's, it's pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to become uh, uh, or be a regular writer for Wing Chun Illustrated was just I just wanted to get better at the craft of writing mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I have written my own books and I plan on writing more books. So writing is like Kung Fu. You know, you, just, yeah. you need to practice. You need to put in the time. And also I kind of like um, being put under a little pressure sometimes for writing those articles because... You know, people always talk about writer's block and, uh, you know, how difficult it is to come up with stuff. So um, basically by taking on the mm. being a, a columnist in the magazine, I force myself Ooh. to 
to learn how to write things quickly and things that are hopefully interesting or have some you know interesting perspective. He's writing chi sao. Yeah, it's writing. Yeah, writing kung fu training, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so it's been tremendously helpful, and I, you know, hopefully my writing style is improving uh, as a result. We were uh, graciously in a uh, column with you at one point. We were talking about like. The guys that, that do, I don't the know. The internal wing, yes. wing chun guys, yeah, yes. who do all those stance demonstrations wait, and wait, stuff. Mikey Dean, you were in that? No, I don't think he was in that photo. Sar yeah. was in that photo. We had a bunch uh, yes. of people in that photo. Yeah. Yeah, so occasionally, you know, my boys and they, you, you've been in there a couple times because we have a bunch of photos. Some of the cheese out photos from the book I, I, I use for some of the articles. Uh -huh. Basically, what because we always shoot so many photos for the books, so we always have, like, extra photos. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when I have to send Eric some photos for, for yeah. an article, I usually have all these extra photos that we didn't use in the books and yep. stuff if like you that. you beating so, my ass or Yeah, me right. beating you, punching you in the beating throat or something <laughs> yeah. like that, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, but um, also Wing Chun Illustrated has, uh, has some cool updates as well. So we're going to be mm -hmm. updating um, our ads for Wing Chun Illustrated, but I figured since we're here talking about it, we might as well talk about it. Um, Wing Chun Illustrated is now offering a paperback edition through Amazon. Yeah. Um, they were not on Amazon before. They're on Amazon now, which means that they're reaching like a much bigger global market, which is awesome. Um, Congrats. And you can still get the, the magazine edition through uh, MagCloud. Oh, right. But now you can get this like paperback edition through Amazon, which is awesome. So you basically choose the version of the magazine you prefer and the one with the mm -hmm. cheapest shipping and, you know, yeah. which depends on where you live. So uh, you can go to like 12, I think 12 different Amazon marketplaces now to get Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine, which is awesome. And That's which lit. means you also get free shipping if you're a Prime member. So for those of you who are Wing Chun Illustrated are fans, you, a prime you can... Member? Of course, I'm a Prime member. Who isn't a Prime member? <laughs> Mikey, right. you're not a Prime member. No, I'm a loser. <laughs> yeah, everyone's a Prime member. <laughs> Somebody get you with that. Yeah, all yeah. hail Bezos. Shipping. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, so I thought that was kind of exciting too. And also, um, you know, we have a Patreon page, as we've discussed many times before. Um, Love the Patreons. Pa Patreons are great. Um, Patreons, like, you can uh, support us for as little as five bucks a month and get episodes early. Usually episodes come out on Monday, and I try to get the episodes it's less posted. less than Netflix, man. Yeah, I try to get the episodes posted by Friday, sometimes Saturday, depends on, on how busy my work week is. But uh, Patreons get it a few days early. Mm -hmm. And I also post other uh, vids and stuff there. I have the Instagram subscription now where I do like one Wing Chun tip a week on, sub yeah. on uh, Instagram subscription. Um, and that's five bucks a month on Instagram. But I didn't want my Patreons to feel like, well, you can support me on Patreon, but then if you want these cool tips, uh -huh. you have to also pay me five bucks on Instagram. So all of our Patreon supporters also get the Instagram stuff too. So if you support us on Patreon for five bucks, you not only get the early episodes, but you also get like, I put the Instagram subscription stuff on there too. So you can get like the weekly tips and everything. Mm -hmm. And then occasionally there's just some little videos that I make that are just for the Patreons or whatever. So, um, and Patreons get first dibs on any Ask Me Anything um, episode stuff. So if you want, right. if, you know, people who want a slightly more direct contact with me, you just get, you know, support us on Patreon and you can send me messages to your heart's content and, and we'll, <laughs> we'll try to fast track that stuff there. What? So um, the Patreon link is in the description below. And so for higher levels of support, we have a baller level. Oh, yeah. And for a baller level, you actually get your own private episode with me, like your own private, like interviewed by KFG yeah. episode. And uh, for other levels of support you can get like a chat with me and stuff like that so we have lots of cool stuff on you get your name in the description of the episode and stuff so yeah if you guys really want to support us go ahead and support us support us so anyway what you got for me today dre wow we got a bunch of things coming at you hopefully you can handle all of these it's early yeah i've only had one coffee i'm about to start my second one <laughs> yeah we'll see yeah. all right we got first andrew lynn andrew lynn Believe i've heard of this not. guy yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah. Believe it or not. God, is he greasing one of your palms? I, he you would, no, you no, would no. think. The, uh, the episode. Yeah. Do you wanna, no, no. You know why Andrew Lynn's questions always get fast-tracked? It's not just because he is the editor of yeah. the Kung Fu Genies podcast. Right. He's also a Patreon. That is lit. <laughs> he is so lit. He edits the episode. And a Patreon. He's also a Patreon. Yeah, Mikey. Right. Are you a Patreon, Mikey? No, hell no. Yeah. Crazy. I'm not paying to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for my paycheck. You know what I'm saying? These services what? don't come for free, son. What? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. This guy over here, man. All right. So we've got a Patreon. What are three life habits or practices you would recommend to martial artists 
to improve their martial arts practice besides actual martial arts training itself. Sifu? Like uh, life skill practices? I guess. Okay. I guess, like First outside one. of there, outside right. of here, outside. I, I think of a couple. Yeah, that except, you that, might ex except, except that no one asked you. That's the difference. No, nah, no one asked. Right, okay. Yeah, that's a new thing. No uh, one asked you. Yeah. <laughs> I like you said, but I, I can think of something. No, yeah, but no, no one's one asking asked. you. No one's <laughs> no asking, one asked you. you. So if you're not local to NYC, one of the easiest ways for you to improve your Wing Chun training is to train online with me. Online private training is tailored toward the individual and geared towards serious practitioners who want to improve their skills or knowledge base. I offer two private lesson subscriptions, twice a month and four times a month. Kung Fu Genius listeners use the code KFG online to get one online consultation lesson free with the purchase of any subscription. That code and the links are in the description below. Online private training is a convenient way for you to ask any of the questions you've had about application, form, theory, or even how to teach. Bring a partner to train with you online at absolutely no extra cost. I'll show you how to train with your partner online. Again, use the code KFG online to get a free consultation lesson with the purchase of any online subscription. Links are in the description below, and I'll see you online. Uh, okay, so three, three habits that martial artists should be in outside of- Life habits. Life habits, okay. That's big. Um, well, I mean, I, I might give a little bit of advice that I don't follow myself, but, uh, but, that, does, but that doesn't mean that it's not powerful. I'm curious of this life habit that you don't follow first, yourself. First life Is habit. Is it hygiene? Wow. What? No, what I'm not this? saying you wow. stink. I'm just asking, what is, is, this? It, is this a life habit what that... What was the implication? You're, you're, not, you're, you're not supposed to let that out. <laughs> yeah, what was the implication? People who don't know about me didn't know, know about the fact that I don't bathe. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Like people don't need to know that. What are, right? what are the? That's one of a big life hack. So the so the first one I would say is get off social media. Oh. Social media is such a waste of time. <laughs> All right. Listen. No one wants to do that. Listen. No to, one wants to do that. Listen life to the Kung Fu genius. <laughs> All right. Just go get old off school. Social media. You know what? Go so, old school. Social media is such a time suck. Um, social Shit. media does nothing but like you know, um, kind of encourage. The, the worst aspects of like who we are. It makes us, you know, it gives Man. us things like FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, it makes us always think everyone else's life is so much better. Mm. And the thing is, it, 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 it's not. You need to get mm. off social media as much as possible. Or what you need to do is you need to um, really um, curate how and when you go on social media. Okay. Like, so I would I recommend- I go during my break at yeah, work. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would say one, you, you don't, my break. Don't, don't go on your phone at all, like for the first hour in the morning, which is like a huge thing. Because the problem is when you, you wake up, you look at your phone, you look at your messages, you, you look no. at your social media or whatever, you're immediately throwing yourself into this like, uh, this, you're now the slave to everything you see on there in terms of like your attitude and what you feel based on, you could open your phone, you look at something, it mm -hmm. puts you in a foul mood for the rest of the day. So you're saying when I go wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and go to take a dump, don't do social media. Read a book. <laughs> read a book about oversharing. Yeah, read a book about oversharing. I think that's the first book you need to read. Everyone takes a morning dump. What are you talking about? That's not. That's no Dre. like o oversharing. oversharing. Dre. Okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> no. I mean, seriously. Like, not not going on the phone in the morning is a really big thing um, because it forces you, or it puts you in a situation where you're not at the whim of whatever kind of weird stuff you read online. Okay. Um, it allows you to set the pace for your day, mm. and I think that um, people should curate their social media where it's like, okay, I'm just going to go on. Instagram for 10 minutes in the morning and then maybe just check my Facebook messages and then like you have a time you schedule it mm -hmm. um, Like you would schedule any other uh, appointment like here's my 15 minutes to go on social media and then have the discipline to not go back on Have that. the discipline to yeah. stay off because it's because it's, by something. it's not helpful. It's not helpful uh, to your goals It's not helpful to anything uh, That you really want to do this is your business. Well, that's a little bit different Mm -hmm. Because Instagram is like a huge part of you know how I market uh, yeah. with KFG and my school and stuff, so I have to be on there. So I, I, my thing is, I treat that also like like it's work. 
Like, okay, I'm gonna go on Instagram now for 20 minutes because I need to post a reel, I need to respond to some messages, and I need to do X, Y, Z. And then I'm done, then I'm out. Now the problem Damn. is my Instagram is really big, so it's very tempting because I'll mm. open my phone and it'll be like, you have 400 yeah. new notifications on Instagram. Which is And then you're always wild. like, hmm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, right? <laughs> what are they um, saying? But what you realize is when you have, uh, you know, for, for people who don't have like a huge social media presence, and I, I don't have like, I'm not mm -hmm. huge on social media. Like it, YouTube, we're not really that big. Yeah. But Instagram, I'm, you know, I'm fairly big on Instagram. But the funny thing is, um, and what you realize is that none of that stuff makes you happy. Mm. All right. Like if you are, if you are not a happy person without a huge social media account, what, what makes you think you're going to be a happy person with, right? <laughs> so I, I consider oh, no. myself like a relatively even keeled person. Um, right. But the first time my Instagram started blowing up, like when I had that first viral video with Svetlana, and I just would come back and it would be like, I was at 8,000, yeah. and then it was 9,000, 10,000, 11, 15, 20, da, 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 and then it starts going up. And I remember when I passed 10,000, I was like, holy 10, cow. 10,000 views. No, no, 10,000 uh, uh, follows on follows. Instagram. okay. And I was like, oh man, I got 10,000 follows on Instagram. Mm. And I was like, wow. And then you look and it's like, what? Well, it says 10K there instead of, uh, you know, whatever right. number, right? And then uh, what you realize after a while is like, you're like, wow, that is so awesome. And I was so happy to get to 10K. And then like it starts going up to 15, to 20. And you're like, oh my God, this is totally crazy. Mm -hmm. And now like um, I've been at like 52K for like two months. Oh, right. Because now it's not growing like the, like the same exponential then, growth yeah. it had before, right? And I'll tell you, like, sometimes when I think about that, it bothers me. Mm. And I'm just like, man, like, why, why, why is it kind of like leveling out right Seems now, right? stagnant. Um, and then I go, like, I know, because I need to make more goofy reels, because Instagram just likes goofy reels. You have to, right. you, you you have gotta, to like, you sell your, you have to sell yourself a little bit to get <laughs> likes and follows on Instagram. Yeah, you sell your soul a little bit. Influence. Yeah, do, do uh. some kind of nonsense stuff, and then, you know, and then I can go back to doing the stuff that I like. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is, then I remind myself, it's like, dude, you have over 50,000 people who elected to follow you on Instagram. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. And there wow. was a point when I was ecstatic to have 10K. Ah. And now it's like, oh, I've had 52K for two months. <laughs> and then what you realize is you go, wow. but that is exactly the trap of social media. Because even when your account gets big, mm. let's say, what happens if I get 100,000? Then, you know, you're, I'm going to be looking at that like going like, why don't I have 200,000? And then you go like, why aren't I at a million? Mm. And then what you realize is like, you cannot look at those things to try to gain any kind of satisfaction from that. So from social media as a consumer, all right, it, it kind of leaves you empty at the end. And then from social media as a presence on the other end, um, I'm happy to have this platform that I can get my message out to so many different people. Now we have that Instagram subscriber thing where people can subscribe and for five bucks and I get a tip and people really like that stuff. And it's cool to interact with people that I wouldn't otherwise normally interact with, like outside of my lineage and stuff. But you realize like, yeah, it's like, I don't care that I only have 52K followers, right? But like, you know, a month or two ago when I had saw that it didn't really grow for a while, it was bothering me. Okay. And I'm like, why is this bothering me? Like, I literally should be so grateful to have this audience. When people go and they see that number of followers, it's like, wow, that's impressive. Right, you got but, all these like new kung fu aficionados, yeah, aficionados but, but, sliding in your DMs but and the, stuff. But the thing is, you, you still like, there's this weird thing where you're like, how come I don't have 100,000? How come I don't have this? And then you just have to realize like, dude, we're lucky enough to just be alive and enjoy what we have here. <laughs> that who gives a shit about any of this stuff, right? Jeez, man. So, um, so I would say like that, curating and consuming way less social media is a very easy way to stay That's focused. One I of mean, the life habits. Yeah. So yeah. I, when I put my phone away uh, at home is when I get the most amount of work done. You know, hmm. I'm not immune to the having to look at my phone regularly Damn. thing that everyone has. I have that problem too. I'm just trying to be a lot more mindful of doing it less and, and being more strategic about when I do it. But okay. if you could kind of go on a social media intermittent fasting, kind of plan that would be really good um second I think thing I'm pretty good at the uh, second thing is i would say uh read more books all right so um and mm. you have to read books about all sorts of topics that are 
uh, if, if you're specifically trying to get better at martial arts, then you have to read topics that are uh, all pertain to different aspects of martial arts. Uh, lately, I've been watching a bunch of videos on YouTube about like uh, how to read more and stuff like that because I read so many books, but you know, again, it's like the Instagram followers. Wow. I'm like, well, how can I read more? You know what I mean? Interesting. You know, like I tell people how many books I read and then they think it's like a flex. But when I say it, I'm like, yeah, but like this other guy reads so many yeah. more books than me. And I, you just like, you realize that at some point you're never going to be able to read all the books that you want to read in a lifetime because you just, you're running out of time, right? Shit. So um, one of the strategies about reading more uh -huh. is to read multiple books at the same time. And um, I've done this from okay. time to time, and I didn't realize that, yeah, during those times when I read multiple books, I generally read all those books much faster. And the reason is because, like, if you just say, I'm only going to read this book until it's finished, before I go and I open another one, then sometimes you get in, stuck in these little lulls in a book where it's like the book is a little bit less interesting, but you still feel like you need to finish it. So you end up kind of slogging through that book. Ooh. But if you have, let's say, three different books you're reading at the same time, you read this one until you get a little tired of it, and then you just pick up the other one and you read it because that one is kind of new and fresh and exciting. You get tired of that, you pick up the other one, and then you come back to the first one. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is you don't really slow down on any of the books because the moment you slow down, you just pick up another book, you read that one. And when you slow down, you get the next one. And then you come back to the first one with new enthusiasm. That's what uh, Bill Gates do. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it makes sense. So, um, and, and I've done that from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't make the connection about how much quicker I read in general. And so I, I, I just saw two videos about how to read faster and more. And like the joke was, you want to read more, like literally read more books at the same time. So pick like three to five books that you're going to read. Three to five yeah, books. Yeah, parallel to each other. Wow. Yeah. So I, I have that. I have like books in different rooms. I have I'm like, going to try it this yeah, week. I have like one by my bedside. I have like... Two at my desk, one in the toilet. Oh, <laughs> you shit. know what I mean? Like you have you have a book, you have a book every room. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hot tip though, right? Make sure those three books aren't War and Peace, Crime and Punishment, <laughs> and like say like I don't know the first. Fifty Guns of, of, of the Power. Not the, the Forty Eight <laughs> Laws of, of Power. Like not those three books at any one time because that is going to be the yes. recipe for reading slower and less books. Right. So what what three I three different topics. What what I generally read is, um, you know, it's interesting. Like. Um, uh, Br Bruce Lee once said in his like lost interview, you know, he says like, you know, martial arts has a very deep meaning as far as my life is concerned. You know, mm. like he talks about as an actor, you know, as a martial artist, as a human being, all these things I've learned from martial arts. Right. And I also feel that it's the same way. When I was a kid, I had very little interest in reading books that did not have to do with martial arts. So I was the kid, like, you know, in, in science class, there's the science textbook. Yeah, you would actually. And right, and right behind the science textbook was Black Belt Magazine. Right. Like, I'm reading Black Belt <laughs> yeah. Magazine, right? Um, I, didn't, I didn't care much about the other stuff, right? But I love reading. Mm -hmm. But I love reading about stuff that I enjoyed. I didn't like reading things that I wasn't interested in. So, but what I realized is the more I got into martial arts, the more it got me into other things. So, like... Being into wow. Chinese martial arts then gave me an interest in Chinese as a language, mm -hmm. which gave me interest specifically into Cantonese, which then later gave me interest in Mandarin because I think it's actually good to kind of know both, which then gives me more interest in Chinese culture and Chinese history. And then so, you know, I start by getting into Chinese martial arts and then later I'm reading, you know, Chinese histor you know, history books about the Qing dynasty and the Ming dynasty, which is not necessarily martial arts related, okay. but these are things you need to know if you're interested in this kind of stuff or the language or learning how to uh, read Chinese. Um, and then there's a whole aspect of physical fitness um, mm. that has to do with martial arts. So then you start reading books about fitness, about cardio training, m muscular uh, tendon strength, all this kind of stuff. And then suddenly I'm reading like science books about sports physiology and training and I got a bunch of books like that right then uh, there's a whole aspect of Chinese martial arts in Hong Kong which is related to triads and gangsters so then I'm reading about the history of um, you know black societies in China and triad societies and all these kind of things and then you know reading a biography about Limpy Ho and about all these like <laughs> gangsters in Hong Kong and then suddenly I'm interested in the ICAC and the police and yeah. the history of corruption in Hong Kong and then so I, I went from a kid who like literally hated reading anything that had to do with history or science to then because of martial arts 
getting really interested in specific aspects of those different topics. So I can read a, a science book if it's related to uh, fitness or sports physiology because I find that super interesting or okay. Chinese culture, Chinese history, Chinese language or the history of organized crime in Asia and Hong Kong in particular and mm -hmm. and all of these kind of things. Not in America though, organized crime. Uh, no, also that's kind of interesting yeah. too but uh, interestingly enough I've read a bunch of books about Chinese gangs here in America about oh, tongs and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, got it. So like the history of the tongs in Chinatown. Yeah. So I have a number of books about that as well. And, uh, you know, so it's like the one thing, the martial arts thing, then brought up all of these other things. Like Bruce Lee said, all these things I learned from martial arts. If it wasn't for having an interest in martial arts, I wouldn't know so much about all these different aspects of Chinese culture, history, you know, sports, physiology, all those kind of things, right? So I find that if you're really into martial arts, you should try to... Uh, sp get a few different books on those different aspects, you know, get, get a book about Wing Chun, you know, from cdwt.com from yeah. get something written by the Kung Fu genius. Get all of yeah. them. Available in the pro shop. <laughs> not my, not my new wooden dummy book because my new wooden dummy book is sold out, but my, my Chi Sao fundamentals book. Uh, yeah, no, the wooden dummy book sold out very fast. Yeah. People like them yeah. th uh, themselves, a wooden dummy. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're going to have to, we, we have to place another, another order. Yeah, yeah. But we're out of some people say like, Oh, did you just write that on your website? You say like, you have no, like we literally, yeah. we sold every single wooden dummy book in that That's first run. Lit. We should absolutely get the cheese out fundamental book because yeah. that is awesome. That is awesome, and it's got you in it. Oh, that's right. That's right. So you know, that's like like you read it. you read a book if you're a Wing Chun practitioner, you know you have a book about Wing Chun. All right, uh, preferably one written by the Kung Fu genius. Yeah. Um, then you have you know maybe a book about something, some aspect of Chinese history or Chinese philosophy you know, Taoism or Buddhism or whatever, mm -hmm. or, you know, and any of those kind of books, right? Then uh, you get something about, you know, physical training, physical fitness, whatever. Like, you, you have these different books, so you're, like, learning these different aspects, and especially if you have ambitions to be, be an instructor. That's, that's what gives you a lot of currency as an instructor. It's not just that you can show, okay, when you do bong sao, you need to do it like this, or you can show the bong, the bong sao to the student, they can feel it, but that you have different ways to explain it, Mm -hmm. uh, different ways to contextualize it for different learning types. Also, that's another really interesting topic, like how different people learn. Yeah. Um, so I'll read books about that. So, I mean, like, I think these are all interests that sprang from teaching martial arts and doing martial arts. But if you look at them on their face, it's actually like a wide variety of things. But uh, it, that's why I say I'm highly specialized, because even when people think I know a lot about other stuff, there's usually some connection to martial arts, which is why that's I that's why I had interest in learning in uh, it to begin with, yeah, right? Good old Black Belt magazine. <clears throat> Black Belt magazine, Inside Kung Fu. Set it off. Yeah, back in the day you had like Karate Inside Illustrated. Kung Fu, yeah, you yeah. had a bunch of different magazines, right? Wow. But it was really Black Belt and Inside Kung Fu. Okay. And those were those were the bangers. Inside Kung Fu, inside the science book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I was in some class and like the teacher caught me. I had like a, <laughs> I had like the he David the David Chow Spangler Kung Fu book, which was like the big, which is like an overview on all the Kung Fu styles oh, and yeah. history of Kung Fu. And I had that like behind whatever textbook. And the teacher came by and was like, <laughs> what is Wing this? Chun Kung Fu? <laughs> that doesn't sound like science. Uh, uh, and I'm nice. like, you're right, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bunch of old men complaining yeah. about the shape of a hand technique oh, uh, wow. over dim sum. Yeah. That's pretty much what Wing Chun is mostly about. <laughs> If you can fast forward, what is Wing Chun actually about? A bunch of cranky old men yeah. complaining about how someone else <laughs> holds their hand during mm -hmm. a stationary form wow. over dim sum, right? This, is, this yeah. is what Wing Chun is. So that was the second one. Read more. Read lots of different things. All right. And the other thing I would say is have a regular fitness routine that does not have to be Wing Chun specific, you know, um, if you are training Wing Chun already in a class and you're doing some, you know, additional Wing Chun training on your own, All right. then it's good to have a regular fitness routine just to kind of keep the machine in good working order. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of talk about specificity. All right. And that's why, uh, you know, for this third habit of like, you know, just have a physical fitness routine. The most important thing is just have one. Yeah. Don't you, you know, the, the, the problem especially in physical fitness, is that there's so many different opinions about the best way to be fit, but the best way to train, about the best way to work out. 
And you can go on YouTube and type in any different type of workout or fitness regimen or um, you know, way of eating or way of dieting or whatever, and you're going to find people who disagree on these topics very uh, strongly. Mm. And you're going to find lots of people who are very jacked, in good shape, um, who are very physically fit. Like myself, yeah. Exactly. Who have completely different takes on how to get fit, even though both of them are yeah. fit. And so the problem is it's very easy when it comes to physical fitness to be like, okay, uh, I'm going to do this type of strength training regimen. And you do it and you see good results. And then you watch some YouTube video where the guy says, yeah, the thing you're doing doesn't work at all. You should do this. <laughs> and then you get this like complex about like, oh man, I'm not training right. I wasn't doing it right. Man, I was time. doing regular progressive overload. I, I should have been doing, doing German wrong. resistance training, uh, German yeah. uh, volume training instead. Quick right? sand escaping. Yeah. And then it's like uh, you do the German volume training and then you see a video. German volume training is totally trash. If you want to, you know, get muscle, you need to do this, this type of split or whatever. And they're oh, like, oh man. damn, I need to do this. And then so it's really easy to get kind of caught in this um, I'm not doing it right when it comes to fitness kind of thing. Now, of course, you can get injured mm -hmm. during fitness. You can lift things wrong and tear stuff. You can get overuse injuries. So you do need to be mindful about how you train. But I think that just doing something mm -hmm. is better than doing nothing because you keep thinking what you're doing is wrong because you're always going to find a YouTube video that's going to tell you that however you're working out, Whatever you do, mm -hmm. it's wrong. And you need to do this thing instead because someone is always trying to tell you something new. So the broad Damn stroke, it. I would say, is try to have some kind of regular cardiovascular training. Five days a week, you know, at 30 minutes a day is ideal for if you want to be slightly more on the high performance end. But even if you just did a little bit less, that's also fine too. And that could be biking or that could be rowing. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of running. I think that's going to... Or jogging. You're Mikey's running or jogging, a huge unless, fan of running. unless unless you have good technique. All right, oh. um, all running and jogging is going to do is just put miles on your hips, what knees, about and track? ankles. Track, track, running. What's the difference between running field. a track and running? What is the difference? I just said running or jogging. What's the High difference? speed running, straight escaping from okay. lions. So it's the same thing I just said. Running without proper actually technique. requires proper technique, right? And so if, if, mm. you, if you do excessive running or jogging for your cardiovascular training, you're also putting miles on your hips, knees, and ankles. And when you do martial arts, you need your hips, knees, and ankles <laughs> to do <laughs> other shit. Okay? You're right. You're right and so that. the difference is when you look at really good runners, mm. okay, what you will notice is that there's not a lot of genetic variety between them. If you look at long-distance runners, marathon runners, True. they have a certain body type. They do. All right? You don't see a guy built like Usain Bolt <laughs> winning marathons, okay? Um, because you need to be, you need to have a certain body type, you need to be a certain weight, have a certain proportion, ratio of hip, ankle for movement and distance. weight because, and also, you know, you have to have the genetics for running. The people who can run long distances are genetically predisposed to run long distances. If I, with my bulky ass <laughs> thick legs, go for an afternoon jog for 30 minutes, okay? Yeah. Then I feel, the, the next day, I mm -hmm. feel like I spent the entire previous day jumping off an eight story building and landing on my feet. Mm. My hips, knees, and ankles scream at me. They go, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. Because my haunches, my legs, my thighs, my calves are too damn thick for long distance running. It's just katung, 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 like this, right? But I can do sprints up a hill and then back down, back down, because you also don't do that that much and also because you're going up a hill and you're exploding. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very different thing, right? So then wow. I can get away with it a little bit, but I could also just use the rower or use an assault bike and I can assault go- Assault bike? Assault bike is the one with the, with the fan. Ah. Okay. And I can go for 30, 45 minutes and keep my heart rate up at a high level without tearing the shit out of my hips, knees, and ankles, all right? Mm. And if I want to really push it for anaerobic conditioning, then I can, bah, you can go on there. And I don't leave the next day feeling like um, I've been, you know, eaten by a buffalo and shit over a cliff. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there are people who have the genetics for running. All right. And, and they, and they can run no problem. Right. And I have, I have students, all right, who like to run. And, uh, I'm this not guy talking wants about to interject. Actually, I'm not, uh, the funny you thing is, tell uh, he wants to the funny thing is I'm not talking about this one here. I'm oh, talking about no. another one. 
who uh, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I really, you know, I, I love running for cardio. And comes in on a weekly basis, going like, man, I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong with my hip. Oh, man, uh. My knee's fucking killing me. Oh, my, <laughs> my ankles are killing me or whatever. And then he's like, yeah, but like, I really love running for my cardio. And then the next week, he's like, oh, man, my ankle, I can't even kick, to, I can't even kick this week. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? And I go <laughs> like, to uh, fire the circus. Yeah, like, uh, it, it might be all that running you're doing, bro. <laughs> like, get a bike. Uh, all right. No. Um, <clears throat> so go smooth. But for people who can run mm -hmm. or have experience running or did learn running and can do it, running is absolutely one of the best things you With can do for cardio. Technique. But if you ha but you have to have proper technique, proper footwear. You have Sheesh. to you, you have to know all that stuff. If you don't know what you're doing and you decide to take up jogging, especially at an older age, don't be uh, don't be shocked when your body just gives you the big middle finger um, <laughs> because of because of all the percussive. Uh, injury that happens and repetitive percussive wear and tear on your joints, right? So, um, but anyway, the, you want to interject, the, the, don't the you? The thing is, I'm not saying a word. The, th not the thing is, <laughs> to have a to have a routine is important. So you got to find the thing that works for you, and mm -hmm. not worry too much about oh, I need to do wing only Wing Chun specific stuff. The Wing Chun stuff you do, the Wing Chun specific training you do, you do in class. And so the front of your shoulders, so for example, when I go to a, with the gym, mm -hmm. I don't do any exercises for the front of my shoulders. Right? I would say, well, you, obviously you do stuff, the front of your shoulders are also going to get work as well. Mm. I should say I don't do anything specifically for the front of my shoulders. Why? Because when you chain punch, when you do tease out, when you do the forms, when you do the dummy, the front head of your shoulder gets a, more than enough work in Wing Chun. To go to a gym and do front raises for your shoulders, if you're doing Wing Chun reg regularly, it's yeah. just extra wear and tear. You get enough of that. Mm -hmm. So what do you do or what do I do when I go to the gym? I strengthen some planes of motion that we don't do in Wing Chun. Okay? Why? Because I want to have balance in my physiology, right? So if the front head of your shoulder gets so much work in Wing Chun from chain punching, chi sao, keeping your arms in front of you, then it doesn't make sense to go to a gym and do a bunch of front lateral raises with a uh, with a dumbbell. You might think like, yeah, I need to do this because I'm, uh, I'm I do I Wing Chun. No, no, no. Make them stronger. You, you get enough of that work in the Wing Chun training. If you go and then lift extra weights in that same plane of motion, then I'm of the opinion at at that point it's really just overuse. Mm -hmm. And all martial artists have overuse injuries. My buddies in jujitsu, my buddies in boxing, karate, whatever. Any martial art you do has something you repeat all the time. Okay. For Wing Chun, it's the chain punches, it's the bong sao, it's the keeping the shoulders down but forward, all that kind of stuff, right? So where do Wing Chun people get overuse stuff? In the front head of the shoulder. It's normal, all right? It's not because of a technical deficiency in Wing Chun. It's like, no, that's our thing, all right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk about overuse injuries, talk to my, my friends in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, because I, I always go like, oh, man, you know, this thing is tweaked on me. This thing is tweaked on me a little bit. Uh, you know, woe is me. I'm getting older, all this kind of stuff. And then, I'll, you know, I'll go and I'll train with Magno mm -hmm. in Jiu-Jitsu. And then he'll just tell me like, oh, yeah, my knee popped out so loud the other day. It made a huge crack sound and everyone heard it. And turned around like this, and they're like, what is that? He's like, oh, that was my knee. And then I go, okay, I guess I'm doing fine. Ouch. You know, because you always go like, oh, I'm getting older, and oh, man, like, Ouch. is Wing Chun really causing my body, like, all this kind of stuff? Like, um, but you, like, I do Wing Chun way more than the average person, because I'm teaching it every day, I'm training it, so obviously I get more overuse than someone who just comes twice a week. But then I'm like, yeah, but I really need to address this, and it's true. But then I talk to my jiu-jitsu friends and like knees out of place, yeah. neck has arthritis, shoulders popped out, fingers broken, toes broken. And I'm like, okay. So sometimes wow. you just need a little bit of perspective to go like, all right, okay. So I'm not like totally destroying myself, right? I'm like, I've had two shoulder surgeries, you know, rotator cuff repair on both sides. I'm like, wow only 45, I've had two shoulder surgeries. And then like, you know, then I hear like TJ Dillashaw, who was like a UFC fighter. It was like talking about how he had like four surgeries on one shoulder Ooh. and he's like 12 years younger than me. And I'm wow. like, oh, okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just perspective. Someone always worse. Yeah, worse it's, someone's always worse off, right? It's called a negative visualization, <laughs> oh, right? Uh, you know, you think about how, how bad it could be and how good you actually have it. Yeah. Sometimes it's a really good yeah, thing to it's, do. It's so, for, so for the, you know, the one thing would be like, try to get off social media and stop 
focusing on that stuff because mm -hmm. it's a huge time suck and it's not good for you psychologically. Um, to read more, preferably multiple books at a time, preferably multiple books of slightly different topics um, so that you can just push through all of them very easily without getting bored. And the third one is have some kind of regular fitness routine that complements your Wing Chun. Uh, so some type of cardio. And then, you know, when you go to the gym, do stuff that you specifically don't do in your Wing Chun training. Don't just train. You know, I know like Wing Chun people, they, they want to do like a very narrow bench press with their hands vertical so that it can mimic the um, uh, Wing Chun punch. And I, I do that sometimes too. You know, like when I go to the gym, I'll do dumbbell presses, but I'll do it with the hands vertical. So it's like Wing Chun punches. Right. But I don't do that too much. You know why? Because I get enough of that work in Wing Chun training. Mm of that mm. specific plane of motion. So when you hit different planes of motion, you, you train the same muscles, but perhaps in a slightly different area of the muscle, and it helps to make the muscle more well-balanced in general, as opposed to like, if you just train the stuff you need for Wing Chun, you're gonna be really, really strong in certain planes of motion and disproportionately weak in other planes of motion. So that's often where injury occurs, where you have a, a huge imbalance between like, you know, my shoulder, one part of my shoulder is super, super strong. Another part of my shoulder is really, really weak. And it's that imbalance that can also often cause things to tweak. Okay. So that's why Wing Chun people who have so much front head of shoulder stuff would benefit greatly from doing things like face pulls. You know, where you're working the a totally different part of your shoulder. You're working your upper back, which is also important for Wing Chun posture. Uh -huh. And you're using the shoulders in a very different way. So create a fitness re regimen that complements your Wing Chun by training stuff that your Wing Chun doesn't specifically train from a physiological standpoint to give your body more balance as, you know, because you are, as much as pe Wing Chun people don't like to say they're athletes, like, yo, Wing Chun ain't a sport, bro. All right, I fight on the streets, there are no rules. Uh, oh, it's not a sport. Man. You know, the whole like anti-sport thing, right? Yeah. I used to be a little bit on that tip because, you know, Wing Chun is, you know, it's not for sport fighting. It's for practical self-defense. But I think that sometimes people go too overboard with like, yo, what I do is not a sport, bro. What I do is just for the streets. Like, sport fighting. Calm, calm down, bro. We don't have rules. Yeah, calm down, bro. All right, yeah. I'll take a sport jujitsu guy who knows no striking and he'll choke you with your own face. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> not knowing any striking just because of his sport mentality, right? Yeah. But I think it's actually, it's a bit wrong to think of uh, yourself as like, you know, uh, just someone who does, you know, a practical martial art. We should all look at ourselves as athletes mm. Um, mm. because whatever physical thing you do, uh, even if it's not a sport in the classical sense, that kind of is your sport. And you also have to train like basketball players don't just do basketball. They also do strength training. They also do road work. They also do other things. So that training they do is to help them be better at basketball. Well, you do martial arts, even if it's for the streets, bro. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, maybe a good idea if you have cardio that doesn't totally suck. Yeah. Uh, maybe a good idea if you have some muscular endurance training where you can punch uh, a heavy bag for two, three minutes at a time without totally gassing out. Um, and maybe it's good that you strengthen your body in ways that complement what you're doing in Wing Chun. And maybe it's good that even though you don't do high kicks in Wing Chun, bro, um, yeah. maybe it's still okay to be flexible, right? Yeah. Like there's a huge anti-flexibility contingent in Wing Chun. Like, yo, Wing Chun, we don't kick high. I don't need to be flexible. Um, no, those are two separate things. In Wing Chun, we don't kick high. <laughs> you still should be flexible yeah. because if you're not flexible, then even your low kick doesn't have any power. If you are flexible, then your low kick is completely free of any impingement. So this idea that you don't need to be flexible because you don't kick high, no, you're a human being. Mm -hmm. You need to be flexible oh, because okay. if you're not flexible now, you're not going to get more flexible in 20, 30 years. And then what's the quality of your life going to be? So Wing Chun people need to shit can this bullshit about, you need to be flexible, bro. <laughs> They're just trying to be lazy. It's why so many older Wing Chun Sifus are just out of shape. And they can say, hey, Wing Chun, we don't kick high. Yeah. Wing Chun, you don't need to be in shape. Maybe you do need to be in shape to be an example to your students. Hey. All right? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good thing. So they see like, that's deep. yeah. I Maybe like they that. should, right? And it doesn't mean that people of different body types cannot do Wing Chun. That's absolutely not true. Um, I'm not taking aim at like people who train Wing Chun earnestly and have different body types. I'm talking aim at the talking. I'm taking aim at the talking heads mm -hmm. who talk so much shit about how good they are, and uh, these guys are not. These guys are not in shape. All right, they're just <clears throat> they're just out of shape dudes talking about oh Wing Chun we don't need to kick high Wing Chun you don't need to be in shape uh, past the donuts. All right. <laughs> Um, no, this is a poor example uh, for your students. All right. 
All right, what else you got for me? Holy mackerel. That was a good question, Andrew Lynn. Yeah. Patreon Man. supporter. <laughs> Seriously, how much money did he pay you? Because you're always just like, oh, that's a great question. That Andrew. is, man. He has the best like, questions. You, you know? know? Yeah, like you're, you're bri bribing you. It's not, no, no, no need for bribes for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's always need for bribes <laughs> with you. Drive. <laughs> so what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected Wing Chun masters in history? Gong Sao Wong, a tribute. Direct students on Sifu Wong Shou Leung offers you just that. Through a series of exclusive conversations, 25 direct students share anecdotes, reflections, and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man behind the legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love this book, and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend it enough. Get yours today. Go to Amazon, type in Gong Sao Wong, and there you go. All right, what do we got? All right, next up we got D Gazd. I don't know how you pronounce his name. I, I'm, I'm I didn't pronounce like, it. You pronounced it. Gazd. G-H-A-Z-D. Gazd. All right. All right, there we go. All right. Mikey, you're an English expert. What would you say? Well, he's English. <laughs> he is British expert. And I am an expert. But we're not, the, the two aren't in exchange. Yeah, yeah. All right, what you got? <laughs> the essence of martial arts is combat and self-defense. The influence and contribution of such a popular and iconic figure as Bruce Lee, whether he was aware of it or not, is greatly justified. This has contributed culturally and socially to the appreciation of Eastern arts and culture and practically to the development of countless martial arts schools of all origins around the world. Mm -hmm. This is a certainty. Yes. My question is, as a Sifu, trainer, teacher, inspiration, how, without the off-putting, and can be boring academic side of some learners overcome this aspect and make sure to pass the message and respect the essence of the origin of martial arts, combat, and self-defense. Thank you again for the show. Always in a good mood. Thanks to Dre. <laughs> And all these exciting and educational discussions. All right. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, yo, you, yo, thank you, uh, D. Gaz. You wrote that bit in. I did not write that. That is random. You wrote that bit in. He said thanks in. to Dre with a question mark. Nat. I don't know what the nat means. Yeah, it's all right. Nat. Uh, maybe oh, he not. meant to write not. Not. He meant to say not. Yeah, so he actually he was clowning you. Not. Uh, okay, so that's that's a good question. Basically, like uh, you know, talking uh, talking about Gat. that the uh, you know Bruce Lee's legacy in terms of shining a huge bright light onto martial arts in general and maybe Chinese martial it's arts in particular, a lot. and how we as kind of current generation martial arts instructors, you know, how do we pass on this uh, important legacy? I suppose the important aspects of martial arts, combat side, maybe the philosophical side, the essence of what mm -hmm. martial arts are. How do we ensure that these things are passed along? Um, and I think this touches on something I've discussed multiple times on this podcast. Um, the way we make sure that the martial art is passed on authentically, um, whatever that means for, you know, that means different things for different people. For some people, passing on a martial art authentically means passing on the spirit of the concepts of that style. For other people, it's about specifically passing on the way the forms are done and these specific drills. And, and so that, that means something for different for everyone, right? But I think par part of at least how we do it here is that we don't expect every single student to pass on that legacy. Mm. Because I think um, there is a tremendous pressure that's put on students who train with Sifu's in very small schools. And what I mean small schools, I mean like the Sifu who teaches three students in their garage. Mm -hmm. And these are their three selected disciples to learn from the master, right? So this is not someone who has a commercial school or has an intention on taking a bunch of different students. They're just, you know, super hyper selective and they only taught these three students. And, um, you know, there's usually the perception is like, oh, this Sifu is so hardcore. 
he only accepted three students and only teaches us in the garage and we're the closed door students and the special students. So on one hand, there's a huge honor in being like the one of the three guys taken on by this hypothetical Sifu in his garage, right? All right. Um, because uh, his methods are so hardcore, they're not for the strip mall martial arts school, all right? Like he's, <laughs> he's too much of the real deal. He can't teach commercially because people just can't hack it. Like that's usually the perception of the kind of Mr. Miyagi style or secret Sifu, you know, the, the chef at the Chinese restaurant was also a Sifu uh. who taught me secretly, whatever, right? This kind of everyone wants to find their version of Mr. Miyagi who's like super hardcore, right? So let's say we have this guy, he teaches three students. Well, he's so hardcore. He accepted these three students only because they themselves are hardcore. Hmm. So now these three students, they, they cannot fully enjoy their martial arts training. And I'll tell you why. Because there's only three of them. And this is the Sifu. There is some kind of expectation that either one of those three or all of those three have to pass on this martial art because they are the ones specially selected by the Sifu to learn this hardcore style and they're the most hardcore That's who can do it. Pressure. So now they can't just come and do this martial arts style because uh, they want to enhance their life or get the great... Um, life enhancing benefits that martial arts training can give them. They now have this additional wow. pressure because yeah, well, you know, Sifu only taught you three guys and when he retires, the only people who know his style are you three guys. So now he's entrusted the fate of his style, his lineage, whatever he's learned from his teacher into these three people, either one of the three, two of the three, or all of the three, wow. to pass it along faithfully and to want to pass it along. You know, now, are these three guys who learn from him, are they good teachers also, or are they just three guys who are learning from him? Uh, do they have the aptitude to pass it along? Do they want to pass it along? What if they have other jobs? What if they decide to go into another field and they never want to teach anyone? Then that style dies. So that's always my issue with these these kind of like these kung fu guys who so proudly boast how, oh, I'm one of only two people who learn from this Sifu. I'm one of only three people who learn this. My Sifu only teaches hardcore people in his basement. Like, I get that. There is a Mr. Miyagi fantasy about finding the secret master and learning from them. There's some very kind of movie montage kind of feel to that. Yeah. But I'll tell you that it's, not as good in reality as we think about those things in our heads. And part of the reason is this. The first reason, like I mentioned, is now the burden of passing on that style, lest the style perish, is on one or all or two of the three. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, guys, one of you guys is going to have to do it. Who's going to okay? step up to the plate? Who's going to step up, wow. right? Um, second... If the teacher has only taught three people in their entire life, then I'm going to guess they're not very polished as an instructor. They mm -hmm. might have talent for teaching naturally. They might be good communicators. But I tell you, when I compare the way I teach now to a number of years ago in terms of my ability to like narrow down mistakes and what to focus on, what I used to think was important versus what I think is important now, yeah, I'm much more polished because I've taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I have this experience of like, I have a lesson plan. I'm very professional in the way that I teach. But if you threw me into a room full of Wing Chun people, even Wing Chun people who are not my students, and without a lesson plan, you told me, hey, teach a two-hour class for these guys. I'd be like, boom, fine. And I would do it. Oh, okay. And it would be entertaining, fun, and challenging. And even if I didn't know too much about the group, because I've done this for such a long time. Mm -hmm. But a Sivu who's only taught three people, the same three people, for their entire time, I'm going to guess that they're not the most um, adaptive or adaptable instructors in terms of teaching different ways and coming up with different things. You know the other problem with being in the super hardcore school that only has two or three really hardcore guys? Is those two or three hardcore guys are the only people you can train with. You don't have a room full of killers or training partners to work with. You just got these three guys, which means you know all their patterns. You know how they move. You've been training with the same guys all the time. So this idea that like, you know, oh, well, I learned really, or the people who say I'm the only disciple of this famous Sifu, right? Great. So he probably is not really that great of a teacher, but he taught you. So you're happy with it. But two, 
who were your training partners? Mm. The stuff that you learned from your Sivu, did you try it on a big guy, a short guy, a strong guy, a guy with little experience who was a good fighter, a guy with a lot of experience who was a good fighter, or did you just learn it from your Sifu, right? So this idea that somehow learning from the secret Sifu with the two to three sworn disciples, yeah, that's cool shit in the movies, but yeah. it means your instructor doesn't have a lot of experience teaching, and two, you have a dearth of training partners because it's only these few guys, right? And you then have all the added pressure of now you got to pass on the style. So to get back to this question here, the way I do it is... I teach professionally. Anyone can come here and learn, and I don't tell people what Wing Chun has to be for them. Because for some people, Wing Chun is just an escape from that job that they can't stand. They're with a boss eight hours a day that they just cannot stand. Yeah. So when they come here for an hour and 15 minutes a night, this is an escape. Yeah. All right, this is just to get out. That's why we have the curtains closed so you don't see the city outside the window. <laughs> oh, right. You just come in here and you feel like you're somewhere in Hong Kong, right? Yeah. Doing something cool. And it's just like, for some people, it's an escape. For other people, it's a way to develop confidence or to learn how to defend themselves. And for other people, they saw the IP Man movie and they want to uh, do what that guy did. And other people are adults who weren't allowed to train martial arts when they're kids. And now that they're adults and they can afford it, they want to do it. So they're making up for lost time. And other people might want to learn the art seriously and get good at it, right? Um, I don't tell people what they have to do to do when they come in, all right? And some martial arts schools are that way. Like, you gotta be a good fighter, you gotta become an instructor, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. And that's the teacher imposing their burden on the students. Not every student who trains in your school should be an instructor because maybe they're not good at communicating and most importantly, maybe they don't want to be an instructor. Right. So why put that burden on them? So when you can teach Wing Chun, in my case, or any martial art, to a group of people who want to learn it for different reasons. The one guy's here for self-defense, the other guy's just here because it's a hobby, and that's fine. The guy doesn't have to be as hardcore as the other people. Oh, he's not as into it as the other people. No, he comes here, or she comes here, for whatever reason, and they keep coming, that's fine. And whatever the reason is, it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But what you find when you have a student base of a bunch of people who come here for their own reasons, is naturally you're going to have people who are going to rise to the top in terms of skill and understanding and ambition. And you see them rising to the top because they train hard, they get it, they're into it. And you go, these are the people I'm going to put extra time in to extend the legacy of what I do. Because those are the people who want it. Mm -hmm. So you cannot force something into a receptacle that's full or just it will not accept anything new. So don't force every student who runs in your school to have to understand the essence of Wing Chun as a deeper philosophical martial art or who have to understand the um, responsibility to pass this on and improve it for future generations. Don't put that burden on everyone who just signed up to your school because they like it. Mm -hmm. Let them come in here and enjoy it. And the ones who rise to the top are the ones that will get the extra attention to potentially bring your art into the future. And then you have a willing group of people accepting that information instead of three people that are forced to have the burden of their instructor because their instructor is too insecure to teach students who are not the best. Mm. All right, what's the next? Wow. Man. Yeah, those hardcore teachers, they do it because, you know, out of one side of their mouth, they're like, I am so hardcore. The way I teach is so hardcore. Only these three people could take it, all yeah. right? And what I say is, you got a big ego. You only want to teach a couple dudes who are really into it because you want to teach those guys and show everyone how hardcore they are. Hmm. Because the proverbial 90-pound weakling who comes in, who's not coordinated, who's not particularly gifted, he makes you, the instructor, look bad in your eyes. Damn. And that means that you do not view your martial art as a vehicle to help people who need it. You view your martial art as a vehicle to look good because you got some students who are physically gifted. So when I hear these kind of like, oh yeah, my Sivu only taught like two people his whole life or whatever, I go, 
in my mind, I go, he's got a huge ego, Man. all right? Because he, uh, and of course, some people don't teach big groups because they have a job. I mean, I'm not saying everyone who teaches a small group or whatever, some, you know, yeah. egoist or something like that. But there's a lot of that going on in Chinese martial arts. I go, he's got a big ego or he's afraid. He's afraid that the uncoordinated student, which, he, which here's the joke, the people who are uncoordinated, the people who are afraid, the people who lack confidence, the people who are afraid of their own shadow, those are the people who need martial arts more than the other people. Mm -hmm. Not the guy who walks in and is like a total banger. Mm -hmm. Every time I go to Hong Kong and I visit whatever Sibak or whatever Kung Fu family member of mine, all right, they always proudly boast their best student. And their yeah. best student is always some dude who looks like Bolo, all right? <laughs> all right. Right. And then you look at this guy and they're like, oh, this is, this is my best student. And he's the biggest kid in their school. Uh -huh. Young, you know, yeah. aggressive. Man. And I go like, that dude he looked like that it. the day he walked in. Yeah, yeah, he didn't The only it. difference is <laughs> that, that guy came in here uh -huh. with BDE, all right? Yo. All right? <laughs> <laughs> and was already kind of aggressive. How do I know what that means? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you know what that means? All right. Was well, already kind of aggressive. Yeah. Potentially already a fighter. Maybe already knew some other martial arts. Mm -hmm. And all you did was teach him how to fight with chain punches and pack outs. Mm. But you did not make this person into someone who's that guy. If you showed me a photo of that guy walking into your school and he was the proverbial 90 pound weakling, like, yeah. eh, and now the guy's like this. I'm like, all right, now <laughs> oh, wow. you built a bank. All right, okay? <laughs> built a bank. But what I often see is that in Kung Fu schools, Chinese martial arts teachers take credit for people who were already physically gifted, talented, intuitive, and um, intelligent enough to learn the system, regardless of how shitty the teacher was. Yeah. And they go, see, yeah, that, that's my student yeah. right there, right? And um, you are not judged by what you do with your strongest, most talented student. Your, your, your worth as an instructor is what you do with the least talented, um, least physically gifted person who walks in your door who actually needs what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. They need to build up their confidence. They need to, you know, because in Wing Chun, when someone punches us, right, we're trying to protect ourselves while we go forward and swarm and get close to our opponent so that we are inside the dangerous ranges of punches and kicks, right? So it takes a little bit of a leap of faith to go yeah. like, I'm gonna swarm someone who's going to punch me rather than just uh, yeah. back away or try to block, right? So there's a huge learning curve in Wing Chun to like change your behavior oh, yeah, to violence. Hell yeah. Um, but there's also a huge metaphor for life in terms of like going for it, going forward, mm -hmm. trying to take your problems head on, being proactive. Oh, so there's a huge aspect of like how the Wing Chun concept works in self-defense uh, compared to what you could be doing in your own life to make yourself more um, productive or effective, yes. right? So uh, the people who need this are the people who lack it. When you have someone who walks in and he's super aggressive, He's ready to fight and you tell him like, all right, when that guy gets too close, you're going to close the gap and boom, murder him with chain punches. Like, all right, cool. All right, all right. All right. He's there, you can do it, right? But then you have someone that's like, you know, they're holding their hands like this and they're afraid and, like, eh. and then you have to get them to go forward and then you see that process over time where they get more and more confident to go forward and to go in and to deal with these things head on. And then you see the change in that kind of person, even if that person is still not as good of a fighter as the other guy. But the percentage of change and growth in that student wow. is tremendous. It doesn't bother me if that student never becomes a great fighter or never becomes a teacher, because that student will always remember the amount of growth and change they had just by coming to the school. And, you know, like sometimes I get emails from students who trained here a long time ago. They don't train here anymore. Maybe life gets in the way or maybe mm -hmm. they moved or whatever. And they just send me messages about like the training that they had here helped them to, you know, ask for a promotion or help them to, you know, get out of a bad relationship or something like that years after they had trained here. Wow. Right. And for me, that's worth just as much, if not more, than my super talented student that I show him something or I show her something and she can do it right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. cool, but that's on them, all right? The student that gained this confidence by training with me, that is the atmosphere that we created and that is the great product of Wing Chun. So uh, 
to answer the question, it's that you let those people who are going to pass on the legacy of Wing Chun, you let them rise to the top mm -hmm. in a group of people who are here for different aims, where you are not forcing your narrative about the essence of martial arts, about being an instructor, about passing it on. You're not forcing that burden on everyone who walks in your door. You are offering it as an opportunity for people who want it. And then it's more organic, and then you have a next generation of people who earned it and wanted it. And that's the way to do it, in my opinion. Wow. All right? Got so uh, we got time for another one? I think so. Yeah, one more. One more? Yeah, one more. All right, next up we got JPS Steve Shanahan. <laughs> All right, there we go. Yeah. I think you got yeah. it this time. I think you might have got it. You think so? Yeah. I think that's the closest that you've been so far. That's right. I've been practicing. Yeah. In front of the mirror. <laughs> Seafood. I don't know about that. Yeah, but I don't think so either. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Just saw a video on BLRFC that claims a legitimate sparring match happened between Bruce and stuntman Carter Wong on the set of WOTD. Mm -hmm. First off, what, what is BLRFC? Uh, I think that's the Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel. Uh -huh. oh, I thought yeah. that was a football club. I right. thought Could that be. was BLRFC. Yeah. No, something I don't want to know what you thought it was. The AVN so. or something. <laughs> the DVDA. <laughs> what is, okay. Who is this, man? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. WOTD. And Bob Wall was a witness to it. Mm -hmm. According to the video, Mr. Wong has a background in Kung Fu, Karate, Taekwondo, Judo, Muay Thai, Hapkido, and a bunch of other shit you ain't other, never heard before. Among other disciplines. Uh huh, yes. Hamster style. But apparently couldn't touch Bruce. <clears throat> but this one, quote, made me think. Many people ask me this question. To be honest, I couldn't even touch Bruce Lee. He was seven years my senior and treated him like a brother. I, all, I was also a fan at the time and didn't think I was qualified to fight him. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but was he implying that he didn't fight Bruce Lee for real out of respect? Are you familiar with this story? Can you share with us your insight, um, Sifu? Alex okay. Richter. So, uh, yeah. So, actually, Shout I saw... Shout out to Dre. Yeah. You made that up. He you made that, that up. Dude, yeah. it's right there. Uh, he's he's pointing that. at the screen. Yeah, it's you right know it's there. Bullshit. He's you pointing are, at the screen. You, Jesus, Thank you made you. that up. Shout out to JPS Steve Shanahan. He uh, don't, you don't deserve shout outs. The amount of times you butchered <laughs> that man's name. <laughs> I never the sort <laughs> ever. Okay. Not such thing. All right. So, um, so here's the thing, the Bruce, so I actually saw this question, yeah. uh, and, uh, looked into it a little bit. Ooh. Um, so normally I, I just, I, I just let you ask the questions, but every <laughs> once in a while I'll look in the YouTube app yeah. and I'll read the, most of the comments are, um, you know, normal questions and mm -hmm. sometimes it's just crazy stuff on the drug letters. So um, but every once in a while hole. I'll see a question and I'll go like, Oh, you know, let me, uh, let me look into it a little bit. Right. Nice. Um, and Glad this so one I did. Up. I did look into it. So first of all, the Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel is another channel, huge Bruce Lee channel on YouTube. Okay. He's maybe ten percent better than Beardy in terms of facts. Wow. Ten, 10 percent. That is a okay. great percentage. No, it's not. When you're okay. already like minus one hundred yeah. fifty-five thousand. When everything you say is a bald-faced lie, <gasps> and someone is ten percent more truthful than you. Wow. That means it's 90% bullshit. I okay? wonder if he even has a so beard. So the Bruce Lee the Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel, the guy I I believe he's Chinese cuz uh, he pronounces everything in, in the Mandarin pronunciation, which is weird cuz Bruce Lee yeah. as Bruce Lee said, first of all, I only speak Cantonese, right? Okay. okay. Um and then so I always just find I I find it funny when Mandarin speakers or westerners who speak Mandarin love to pronounce all of Bruce Lee's shit in Mandarin. <laughs> Because it's just like, yo, bro, all right, he didn't speak Mandarin. And that's not how those films are known oh, in Hong no. Kong, all right? Oh, damn. Li Xiaolong, all right? Uh, Li Xiaolong, all right? Stop, hey. stop Mandarinizing him, all right? Stop okay. Mandarinizing. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so I think he's a Chinese guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
and he has these videos and very similar concept to Birdie. He tells Bruce Lee stories. Oh, let me tell you about when Bruce Lee fought this guy. And like Beardy, uh, he never shows himself. Ooh. Okay? And also like Beardy, he has tons of subs and huge videos. What? We yeah. haven't he even checked he, he out even yet? Used, uh, well, I, I've seen a couple of his videos. Uh -huh. um, he occasionally tells something... Uh, Factual, what, what was, actual? No, was Stephen Colbert had that word truthiness, <laughs> where they're like they're like it's like a bullshit story with little nuggets, <laughs> sprinkles of some truth it has, in it. It has some truth. It's not the truth. Yes, oh, yes. No. It's not like Beardy where he just makes stuff up. Yes, and the medical Spewing. community contacted me yeah. about Grandmaster Baxter. <laughs> like he just makes every like he just totally lies. Um, Bruce Lee Real Free Fight style. Channel tries to find some stuff that's like it's like 50 50 and mm. then he'll kind of bullshit the rest right oh. so um so bruce lee real fight channel is one of these guys i've been asked a few times in the comments yeah. to take on his videos the way we took on birdies what? so i i think i think maybe we, we have, have a bruce it? lee real fight channel okay reaction because when I looked at this Carter Wong video, so of course most people know Carter Wong from uh, Westerners known from Big Trouble in Little China. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the 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 one of the, the three storms, right? He was the only guy with speaking lines, the one who blew up like a cabbage patch doll. The end, oh, right? Man. Spoiler alert. Yes. Yeah. And Carter Wong had done a, you know, he had started getting into films around the time that Bruce Lee was making movies, so the early seventies, and he was also. Uh, um, contracted to Golden Harvest, right? So this, but also this thing like, oh, uh, Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel, like, oh, uh, Carter Wong, Bruce Lee was on the set of Way of the Dragon and Carter Wong showed up. He wasn't, that was on the Hapkido set. So even, even, on, ba even on basic ass facts, oh. um, Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel is wrong on basic stuff because there are photos of Bruce Lee and Carter Wong together. Okay. And uh, some of them are just kind of like the two of them, uh, there's this on the set of Hapkido. It's, they're, they're taken, I believe, the same day that Bruce took those photos with Angela and stuff. And Bruce came with Chuck Norris and Bob Wall because they were putting together the fight scene for uh, Way of the Dragon. But it was on the set of Hapkido. It was not on the set of Way of the Dragon. No, it's right. just that Bruce had Chuck and Bob Wall with him. But that doesn't mean it was the set of uh, Way of the Dragon. And then there are a couple photos. One where like Bruce is giving a palm strike to Carter Wong. And Carter Wong is like kind of just taking it. And then I think there's one where he's posing a kick. And these are just like, hey, let me show you some of the martial arts stuff that I do. It wasn't him challenging Carter Wong or Carter Wong challenging him and them having a fight. It's like Bruce, every time you were in a room with Bruce, he's going to show you his hand speed. He's going to show you his kicks. Yeah. He's going to do this. And that's all it was. And then um, Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel made up a story that it was a challenge fight. Or it was a fight between Carter Wong, like testing him out, which totally makes sense that, you know, Bruce would fight someone else who's on contract with the same movie company that he's with. Right. Because uh, this man. is how normal adult behavior works. Right. Yeah. Um, and then what he did was and this is why I think that the Bruce Lee Real Fight channel is just as much of a scumbag as Beardy, because he also um, like Beardy knows he's full of shit because he's just making stuff up. OK. Like, I mean, he, like, he, he has to know. Like, you think he knows? He, he called Dan and Asanto Grandmaster Baxter, okay? <laughs> no, no, come on. He, no, come on. He knows he's making it up because th th there is, this I don't is. Know if he knows. Dre, calling someone who's obviously Dan and Asanto Grandmaster Baxter is not a matter of him getting his facts wrong. There wasn't a Grandmaster Baxter in the Kempo scene of the 1960s where Beardy just happened to get the facts wrong about this person. Dre, he it's a Dre, it's a fucking name he made up. All wow. right, why, why is this difficult for you to understand? It's a fucking name he made up. There was no Grandmaster Baxter <laughs> in the 1960s, <laughs> oh, and then no. Beardy looked at it and was like, "Oh, I think this is that Grandmaster Baxter guy from Kempo Karate." There is no Grandmaster Baxter. All right, Damn. he literally made it up. Okay, so he knows he's lying, but Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel also knows he's lying too, because um, when I looked at his video, the, this one in question. Um, it's just the guy talking the whole time, the Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel guy talking the whole time. And then he shows an interview with Carter Wong, mm -hmm. where Carter Wong is supposedly talking about this fight. And you know what this dude did? He overdubbed Carter Wong. 
And so basically, because Carter Wong is originally speaking Chinese in the interview, so he's doing the translation. But the thing is, he doesn't play the original audio of Carter Wong speaking Chinese and then run, say, subtitles or let Carter Wong say something in Chinese and then he translates afterwards. Oh. He cuts out Carter Wong's audio and overdubs him as if he's, as if it's like, as if it's a dub. Huh. You know what I mean? But basically it's Real Fight Channel guy saying whatever he wants to say over Carter Wong. So he's going, yeah, when I fought Bruce Lee, it was like da, 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 da. And he's just making it up in the same kind of beardy way. In fact, in some bizarre way, if I found out that Beardy and Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel were the same person, I would not wow. be that shocked. That All right. will be something. Um, and then I'm like, what? I'm like, why isn't he showing the original Carter Wong interview with subtitles or with the original Chinese audio so we can hear it? Because he's fucking making it up. I found two interviews with Carter Wong on YouTube because then I went down that rabbit hole yeah. where he talked about meeting Bruce Lee on the set of Hapkido. And on two separate interviews taken in different years, he said the same thing. Bruce Lee just came to the set of Hapkido. They were like, oh, man, Bruce Lee is here. And um, Carter Wong knew Bruce's brother. Okay. And then so he talked to him. It's like, oh, you knew my brother. And then they're there. And then he said, and then Bruce Lee demonstrated some of his Jeet Kune Do techniques to show me how fast he was. There was nothing about a fight. And he says that, and it was like the most innocuous thing. And he's talking about how awed and shocked he was by Bruce Lee and everything yeah. like that. And then like the Real Fight Channel video makes it seem like that they were in a fight. Wow. First of all, Carter Wong was too low level for Bruce Lee to even sully his hands with him, right? Uh, Bruce Lee <laughs> okay. wouldn't even give Lao Tai Chun at the time of day. And Lao uh. Tai Chun was, was uh, at least equal to Carter Wong at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so interesting. Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel is another bullshit Bruce Lee channel out there that literally just makes up stuff about Bruce Lee. But because he has a, the ability to say some things in Mandarin, I think people go like, oh, well, there's a Chinese guy. He must be saying the truth, all right? My, my challenge to the Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel is that interview of Carter Wong that he showed. Um, I couldn't find that particular interview, all right? So, so play it with its original Chinese. Yeah. All right. You, you know, like where you play can, it with the original Chinese. You know why you couldn't find that particular interview? Where Beardy hasn't discovered it yet, oh. and then like remastered it. That's right. That's right. That's, That's why. True. Yeah. So apparently, the way to make money on YouTube is to not show your face, and to make up bullshit stories <laughs> about Bruce Lee. And that's all I gotta say about that. All right, peeps. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. If you have any questions for me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write those in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. Is your mic on, Mikey? Uh... Is the mic on? Yeah. Can you make sounds? Oh, the is your mic on, Sifu? Yes, my mic is on. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, who would you? Hey, hey. got to keep it down over there. You were talking. I was bearding. I you. need yeah. to do this. You need to not talk. Yes. All right. Dre, yeah, Dre, Dre. Oh, Dre. My bad. My bad. All right. Bow, bow. Dre. Dre, I'm going to f*** you up when it's your turn. Don't you try and get me Dre, into I'm going to f*** you up. I'm going to f*** you up. You have no idea. Turn your face. Look at the dummy over there. Turn your face. No, no. Turn, Turn your face. face. Look at that dummy over there. Now, look at that dummy there. Everyone. And I want you to find a grain of wood on that dummy. And I want you to focus all your mindfulness on that, okay? All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. I see what... Dre. 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 Don't move. You are a dick. Yeah, he's being a dick. Uh, just wait until it's your turn. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of I'm going to kill Dre. We should actually record the podcast an hour and a half earlier than we do so that I can teach him his lesson after the podcast instead of before. Sounds like No! Then, because then basically based on how he acts, then I'll just beat his ass in the lesson. Because you know what? I got, here no. at, I got here at the ass crack of dawn and I taught him a private lesson. Yo. We went step by step. 
and then we, we built it up it and great. then we started moving at the end i'm yeah. working with him and i'm building him up i'm being the good sifu and then he shits on me <laughs> oh, no. in the next hour That's in the episode this morning when i got here early and i taught you i brought it as a service yeah. provider no i agree I yes agree. and right now <laughs> you are being a I'm punk turned, ass bitch all right i've turned around okay now quiet most important thing is quiet Yo, you filmed me. All right, now it's your turn. All right, now it's your turn, Dre. All right, peeps. On <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yo, Mikey has to go to work. Yeah, I know. In a few minutes. Yeah. It's called karma. You look like you've been eaten by a buffalo and shit over a cliff. You ever shit over a cliff? Not lately. That shit is fun. All right, peoples. <laughs> <laughs> All right, peeps. Uh <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's a nasty cough. It's block. called karma, you bitch. Mental, mental block, mental block, mental block them out. His mental block is the name for his braid. <laughs> <laughs> That's his mental block. <laughs> All right, peeps, on today's episode. <laughs> what the hell? All right, peeps. <sighs> All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems. <laughs> lots of gems, man. And lots of BLRG, BAT. Bruce Lee Real Fight Channel Bruce Lee is Real the new Fight Real Fight Channels. Birdie. Is Bruce Lee Real Chite Fight Channels? <laughs> real Shite. <laughs> is Bruce Lee Real Bruce Lee Fight real Channel the channel. Real Bitch? Actually, that's a is, better is, name is for Bruce, it. I think. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of <laughs> the vanga. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius. <laughs> All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of... I've been doing this with Dre so long, I can tell by how he starts it, whether he'll be able to finish it or not. If he comes in at a certain energy level, he always fails. Go. Come in cold and yeah, finish yeah. hot. Yeah, come in like Go a lamb ahead. and out like a lion ass. All right, all right peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of great Kung Fu habits, lots of... <laughs> lots of B-O-R-C-F you! Lots of great Kung Fu habits, lots of is the B ah. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius to genius. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of... What? <laughs> what? About fucking time. Jesus, Dre. Hercules, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules. 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 All right.